Recently, I have been interested in a deeper study of some of the parables that Jesus shared after he shared Matthew 24, which means these parables have special application to the last time. And I believe we're in the last time. Uh, in fact, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to get a Sunday law before a year is over. I'm not saying it's going to happen this year, but it wouldn't surprise me because the groundwork is basically laid. It's just a matter of when God allows it to happen. And so I believe these parables need to be really examined, not just for intellectual information, but to test our own condition. So I've entitled this one, Behold the Bridegroom. And it'll be part one because we can't cover it all in one message. Let's take a look at who is this for? Who should really pay attention to this parable? From Christ Object Lessons 406, As Christ sat looking upon the party that waited for the bridegroom, he told his disciples the story of the ten virgins by their experience illustrating the experience of the church that shall live just before his second coming. And who's that? That's us. Now this parable, as is always the case with Christ, he didn't just grab stories out of the hat. They were watching this happen down in the valley. And Jesus took that object lesson that they were looking at, and he framed this parable for Seventh-day Adventists at this hour of Earth's history, between now and the time that Jesus actually appears in the clouds of heaven. Also in uh, Signs of the Times of April 21, 1898, it says here the condition of the church at Christ's second coming is portrayed. Now that's referring to another parable. Again, its spiritual condition is described in the parable of the ten virgins. So the spiritual condition of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is described in this parable. And you know the parable well enough to know that there are two groups of people. And every one of us here today and everyone throughout the world field of Seventh-day Adventists fit into one or the other of these two uh, categories. If you discover that you are in the wrong one, there's still time to get out of that one into the other one. But eventually, it'll be too late. So we don't want to just go on, you know, not thinking over our situation, because then the time can close and we didn't realize that we we're in the wrong category. So I believe it is something serious for us to think about, not to get discouraged over. God doesn't tell us these things to say, oh no, I'm in the wrong class, there's no hope for me, I might as well give up. No, that's never what he's saying. <laughs> he's saying, let me help you, always. So we'll begin with verse 1, Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, and the then refers to us right now, then, shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So all of us have believed and we have maybe even taught that Jesus is coming soon. So they went forth to meet the bridegroom. 
Now the three symbols are uh, explained quickly here. The virgins are explained in Christ Object Lessons 406. They are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. So anyone that's a Seventh-day Adventist is claiming to have a pure faith. And we point out the errors that are in other religious organizations, but we claim to have a pure faith. That means we're illustrated here by virgins. Notice it doesn't say that we have a pure faith, but we claim to have a pure faith. Second symbol, the lamps. Uh, Psalm 119, 105 explains that one. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But here we will discover there's a difference. The two groups use the Bible differently, but both have their Bibles. They might even have one of the expensive ones. Cost $100 or more. And they all have their Bibles. Another symbol uh, says they were going forth to meet the bridegroom. Great Controversy 393 <coughs> points to a historic fulfillment of this, which forces us to believe that there are two applications of this in the end of time. Because the first one was long done. And that was what we call the midnight cry that was given in the summer of 1844 until October 22 of that year. That was the midnight cry. And it was basically the preaching of the second angel's message of Revelation 14. So this reference is talking about that fulfillment. The coming of Christ as announced by the first angel's message, was understood to be represented by the coming of the bridegroom. So when William Miller and all those that joined him were preaching the first angel's message from, you know, around uh, 1825, somewhere in there, to, to uh, 1843, they were preaching the first angel's message, which was an announcement that Jesus was coming. And they even put a date or approximate date at first, and later they put an exact date on it. This was a fulfillment of the call to go out and meet the bridegroom. Here's some Bible texts that make clear who the bridegroom is. Isaiah 62, 5. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. So, in other words, the bridegroom is Jesus. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, which is the church, so shall thy God Rejoice over thee. <coughs> now, if he didn't help us, he wouldn't have anything to rejoice over. But what he's rejoicing is what people have let him do in their lives. How he, they have allowed him to change them into beautiful virgins. A virgin illustrates purity, and that's what takes place. We don't start out that way, but we end up that way. Also in uh, Matthew 9, verses 14 and 15, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn? as long as the bridegroom is with them? He's saying, 
can they mourn while I am with them? I'm the bridegroom. And can they mourn while I'm here? No, they can't. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. And so Jesus died. He was taken from them. He came back for 40 days, but then he left. And they would fast after that, but not while the bridegroom was with him. So this and other texts make it clear that it is talking about the second coming of Jesus. He's the bridegroom. And every Seventh-day Adventist has said, I'm going out to meet him. Every Adventist, or they weren't Adventists yet in the sense that we are today, but those who embraced the Millerite message they were going out to meet the bridegroom. That's the way they looked at it, especially in the summer and fall of 1844. Going on in verses 2 through 4 of Matthew 25. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. In other words, they had a lamp, and it sounds like maybe there was some, either they didn't need to put it on because it was still daylight, <clears throat> but they didn't take any extra oil. They took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So here, in a parable form, it describes the difference between the two. Well, probably you know what the oil is, but uh, here in Zechariah 4, verse 6, 11, and 14, it says, not by might. In other words, not by physical strength, nor by power, not by mental abilities, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. How are you building your character today? Are you trying to do it by physical energy? Are you trying to do it by mental energy? If you are, your character will never be what it should be, and you will not be having the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Then it explains about the oil. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So God has planned for a continuous flow of oil. But not everyone is willing to receive it. And that makes the difference between the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. Notice this from Christ Object Lessons 408. So from the holy ones that stand in God's presence, his spirit is imparted to the human instrumentalities who are consecrated to his service. So it's not just enough to be what we call a pew warmer. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't flow to pew warmers. It flows to those that are involved in saving others, those that are involved in service to others. And then it says this, the mission of the two anointed ones is to communicate to God's people that heavenly grace which alone can make his word a lamp to the feet and a light to the path. They all read their Bible, but the foolish virgins do not have the assistance of the Holy Spirit in reading their Bible. And so two things happen. They don't get the point Often, they miss what it's talking about. Second, they are not able to live what it says. 
They know about it, but they don't live it. Because you can't live it without the power of the Holy Spirit. And here we, we see what's the problem. Why these five turn out to be foolish. And by the way, you know, it's very interesting. He didn't have nine uh, good virgins and one foolish. It was divided right down the middle. This is saying to us, there's a huge group in the Adventist church. They're not going to make it. They're going to turn out to be foolish virgins. And this is the reason why, right here. Well, in verse 5 we read, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. So both the wise and the foolish slept. But we're going to learn that it was a different sleep. It wasn't the same sleep. Why would they fall asleep? Because it didn't come as fast as they thought. You know, my father, as he was in college, he believed that Jesus was coming soon. In fact, he told me that he was afraid that Jesus would come before he could get married. Now he's been dead quite a few years at 94 years old. So one of the problems that causes the sleeping is the tarrying. The bridegroom doesn't come as fast as they thought. And that happened, of course, back then in, in Miller's time. And it's happening again. And we even have people in high places suggesting that Jesus might not come for a hundred years, that there's a lot of work to get done. Well, I agree there's a lot of work to get done, but God can do it so fast that it doesn't take a hundred years to get the work done, even with all that's undone now. So we need to be careful about this tarrying business to where we, we fall asleep because of the tarrying. Christ Object Lessons 408 says, All had lamps <clears throat> and vessels for oil. For a time there was seen no difference between them. So, you know, you look at the congregations throughout the world, they look good. Uh, there's some things that don't look too good to me because people are not paying attention to what God said. But uh, even if it looks good, you see, they look the same. So, with the church that lives <clears throat> just before Christ's second coming. You know, I never, I never speak proudly about the fact that we're getting up around 22 million people. Because what does it matter how many people we have? It's the ones that are going to go through, the ones that are going to successfully make it to the kingdom that we need to be encouraged about, not how many are in there. All have a knowledge of the scriptures. All have heard the message of Christ's near approach and, notice this, confidently expect his appearing. So the foolish virgins are expecting to be saved when Jesus comes. All of them are, but the foolish ones are going to be disappointed. They're going to hear the statement from Jesus, I never knew you, depart from ye, ye workers of iniquity. But they're not prepared for that. They're expecting him to welcome them. But as in the parable, so it is now. A time of waiting intervenes. Faith is tried, and when the cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. Why? They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. So the wise virgins have the Holy Spirit even though they're sleeping, but the foolish virgins don't have the Holy Spirit. And as a result, they will not be able to be ready 
and, and meet the bridegroom when he comes. Now why are they sleeping? In uh, Fourth Spirit of Prophecy, page 242, it says, The passing of the time of expectation, the disappointment and the delay were represented by the tearing of the bridegroom. So William Miller wasn't as careful to discover the exact date. And so he predicted from his study of the scripture, he predicted that Jesus would come no later than the spring of 1844. But when the spring of 1844 came, Jesus did not come. And we had what was the first disappointment. I am told that at that time we had about 300,000 followers of the Millerite message, but this tarrying time changed things drastically because of two things, and we'll read what they are. After the definite time had passed, the true believers were still united in the belief that the end of all things was at hand. So the wise virgins did not give up their belief in the coming of Jesus. But they were uncertain what happened. We don't know what happened. But, <clears throat> but it soon became evident that they were losing, to some extent, their zeal and devotion. So that's why they were sleeping. They weren't as zealous anymore. They weren't as dedicated to God anymore. They hadn't given up the hope of Jesus coming, but they just were not the same as what they had been before. They were confused. They didn't really know, you know, what, what's happened and were falling into the state denoted in the parable by the slumbering of the virgins during the tarrying time. Again, on Great Controversy 394, describes it a little more. They all slumbered and slept. So, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, we're probably sleeping right now. But hopefully we're sleeping like the wise virgins and not like the foolish virgins. But a large percentage of the Adventist church are sleeping like the foolish virgins and you don't want to be one of those. <clears throat> they all slumbered and slept. One class in con unconcern and abandonment of their faith. So they said, ah, we're deceived. We're just not going to worry about this message at all. And they fell asleep. That's the, that's the foolish virgins. Yet in the night of trial, the latter seemed to lose to some extent their zeal and devotion. That's the wise virgins. They lost their zeal and their devotion. Going back to the foolish, the half-hearted and superficial could no longer lean upon the faith of their brethren. This is a real key. Now, this is not an easy one because all of us have listened to somebody that can preach the truth so clearly that you can say, Amen, that's right. But if you can't study it and find out that it's right from your own study, Guess what? You're in danger of ending up among the foolish virgins. And many Seventh-day Adventists are not studying it to see if it's right. They just believe it's right because they've heard some good speakers on it, some teachers and whatever, and so they're convinced that what we believe is right. But everyone that believes it because of what somebody else said instead of their own study is going to end up in the foolish virgins. So you need to give study to these things. We all need to be Bereans. 
Whenever anybody shares anything, we need to go home, check it out. And if we can see what they're saying is right, then uh, we can stand because we know it for ourselves. But otherwise, we're going to say, well, maybe they were wrong and be cast it aside. Each must stand or fall for himself. So we're not going to go through this in groups. Everybody is tested as though they were the only one. And how they come out is explained in this parable. <coughs> Each must stand or fall for himself. About this time, fanaticism began to appear. And the foolish virgins fell for the fanaticism. The wise virgins did not, but the foolish ones did. Unfortunately, I can see many Seventh-day Adventists falling for fanatical ideas today. And they're growing. I'll just mention one of them. The idea that there is not that there are not three members of the Godhead is a big one. It's sweeping Adventists that I never dreamed would get confused on that issue. And so on. What is this saying? It's saying that they're one of the foolish virgins. Because that's one of the things that happens to foolish virgins. You get tripped up when you don't have the Holy Spirit to really help you understand what the Bible is saying. You get tripped up. And we might think we never could get tripped up. And we're following, you know, Doug Batchelor, and we don't think he could ever be wrong. And so, uh, if we don't know for ourselves, that's what's going to happen to all the foolish virgins. Going back to the historic fulfillment of this, in Great Controversy 398, it says, In the summer of 1844, midway between the time when it had been first thought that the 2300 days would end, and the autumn of the same year to which it was afterward found that they extended, the message was proclaimed in the very words of Scripture. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Now I was trying to think, <clears throat> what would be the application of the midnight cry for us? Because, you know, this, what we're talking about, happened way before our birth. I suggest to you that when the loud cry of the third angel happens, that is the midnight cry, the primary fulfillment. This other one was a fulfillment to help us understand the last one, how the last one's going to be. And so we need to not expect, we should not expect to have all the way to the close of probation to get ready as Seventh day Adventists. We can't. We have to get ready so that when it's time for the midnight cry, we're ready to give that message. And if we're a foolish virgin, by the time of the final midnight cry, we're not going to make it. The rest of the world has more time. But we're not going to have as much time as they did. You might be aware of the fact that when the midnight cry was given, they could only get about 50,000 that would accept it. So that means 250,000 wouldn't accept it. Only 50,000 accepted it. So this is going to be repeated. Again, <clears throat> why they couldn't share. It says in the Review and Herald of September 17, 1895, why is it that the wise did not divide their supply of oil? I don't know whether you ever wondered that. I did when I first heard the parable. You know, that's not that kind of selfish that you've got oil and you won't share it. But as we make the spiritual application of the parable, we can see the reason. 
It is not possible for those who have faith and grace to divide their supply with those who have not. So the foolish virgins, they don't have enough faith to go through this. They, they can't trust God through this. Their faith gives out. And somebody that has faith may inspire someone to want to have faith, but they can't give it to them. Only the people that have developed that faith, and that's why they can't share. It is not possible for those who have faith and grace to divide their supply with those who have not. It is not possible for those who have made a thorough heart work. See, the, the wise virgins have allowed Jesus to really work in their life and be changed. And they, they can't give that to the foolish virgins who have failed to do that. It is not possible for those who have made a thorough heart work to impart the benefit of this to those who have done but surface work. The parable is designed to point out the peril of doing a surface work. We must not allow ourselves to be fooled by the fact that we know we must live what God has told us to do. And we can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Whenever you discover that you are failing, Again, no, don't be discouraged. That's not what he's telling us. He's saying, connect to me more. Let me do more in your life. And if we will do that, we will be able to grow to the full stature that we need to. In Christ Object Lessons 408 and 9, it says, Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is of no avail. Knowing the truth is of no avail. The theory of the truth unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the Spirit, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error, and they will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. So knowing the truth does not fortify us to reject error. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life that has assisted them and will always assist them to say, no, there's something not right about that. Go and study. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our study to see, no, that's not right. And on the one issue that I brought up, literally the New Testament and even the Old Testament is full of evidence in regard to three members of the Godhead. But that is totally ignored and missed. It's not that they're trying to ignore it. They can't see it because they don't have the help of the Holy Spirit. In review, uh, why did these five virgins become foolish? This is in my own words now. Why did they become foolish? Number one, they didn't feel the need of the Holy Spirit to guide their Bible study. They just took out their Bible, they studied, they felt they understood it, and they could even explain it to other people, but they didn't really feel their need of having the Holy Spirit guide their mind as they studied the Bible. Number two, their faith was too weak doesn't say they didn't have any, but their faith was too weak. They didn't go through the experiences that, you know, God is training us to have faith by putting us through various experiences. And as they went through those experiences, their faith didn't grow. 
Again, because they were not connected with the Holy Spirit, or maybe they avoided. Sometimes we can avoid the test that God gives us because we don't want it. And whatever reason, their faith does not get developed. Number three, their character was not transformed. They probably had some changes because there's always some surface changes that we can make, but they really didn't develop the kind of character that comes about through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And number four, they could not recognize error. So they got tripped up on some of the fanatical ideas that came around. And number five, they only understood the theory of the truth. They didn't really understand it in practice. And so here, I think with what we've looked at this morning, if each one of us could honestly ask God to reveal, what are we like this morning? Are we one of the wise virgins? We have to admit we're all asleep right now. But when the latter rain starts being poured out, we're going to wake up. And we're going to have a zeal. We're going to have devotion that we don't have right now. But <clears throat> if we discover that we have the characteristics of the foolish virgin, I don't think we have very long before that latter rain is going to fall. Some people feel it's falling already, but from my study, it's uh, to happen in connection with the National Sunday Law. That's the major thrust of the latter rain. And so what's happening now is an abundance sometimes of the early rain, but it's not the latter rain. So when that comes, at that point, you know, I, I can't say that there'll be a, you know, one date for the shutoff of everybody, but that will be certainly the beginning of the end for Seventh-day Adventists, that the foolish virgins that are still foolish may not recover from it. Now is the time to recover if we see that we are one of the foolish virgins. So may God help us to prayerfully consider what you've heard this morning.